here we have uh, several participants that make the presentation about the effective effective uh, applications of multi-stakeholder initiatives and different areas. I, I, uh, my, my, I'm, my name is Henrique Falhaber. I'm one of the board members of CGIBR, the Net Brazil Steering Committee. Uh, I will participate as a moderator and also as a speaker uh, when we talk about uh, our initiative regarding Spain in Brazil. Uh, first, uh, I will ask Alexandre to do the opening. Uh, please, Alexandre, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Henrique. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here with you. Uh, well, I believe this uh, workshop uh, presents us a, a very good opportunity uh, to reflect uh, on the implementation of the WISIS Declaration of Principles. Uh, as, as mentioned by Henrique, in the context of the, the WISIS Plus 10 review process, to which uh, Brazil attributes great importance, by the way, uh, we'll have the chance to learn more about uh, some multi-stakeholder initiatives that, uh, of course, were developed following uh, the principles established in the Geneva Declaration in the, in the, in the first phase of, of the World Summit on Information Society. As you know, of, uh, I, 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 well, I, first of all, I forgot to present myself. I'm Alexandre Fontinelli. I'm from uh, the Ministry of External Relations of Brazil. And uh, I, as you know, Brazil uh, has been participating very actively in the follow-up to the WISIS, of course, not only in the governmental uh, level, but uh, all multi stakeholders are, uh, are involved in, in the different fora that have been uh, discussing uh, uh, the implementation of, of the re recommendations of the WISIS. Uh, internally, uh, we have developed, as most of you are already familiar, uh, the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, uh, CGI.br. It is a, a multi-stakeholder entity uh, comprised of 21 members uh, representing government, private sector, civil society, academia, and technical communities. Uh, and uh, for the past years, this initiative, uh, this model has been attracting a lot of attention from many countries and different stakeholders for its de transparent, democratic, and inclusive approach, which uh, uh, coincides and converges with uh, what was established at the uh, at the WISIS summit. Um, uh, the CGI aims at coordinating and integrating all, all internet uh, service initiatives in Brazil, uh, promoting uh, innovation, uh, quality <coughs> dissemination of services, and of course, um, uh, also managing the, the, the .br through NICBR. And well, its, it's uh, financial resources, of course, are not, were not only uh, are not only destined to that, but also to foster research and, and different initiatives. As later on, we will uh, in this panel we'll see uh, how imp how imp how important is the, these initiatives are. It was also in the CGIBR that there was developed the, the ten principles for the governance and use of internet, uh, which we already presented in previous editions of of IGF, and which had an, an important role in the. Uh, development of the Brazilian Marco Civil da Internet, uh, which is in discussion in the Brazilian Congress. This, of, uh, will, as mentioned by Minister Paulo Bernardo in, in the opening, opening session, will be a, a modern legislation that will establish a set of principles uh, for the usage of Internet in Brazil, while also defining rights and duties of Internet users. And uh, these same principles uh, also guided uh, President uh, Dilma's Rousseff's speech at the United Nations General Assembly this year. Uh, in that occasion, uh, she mentioned uh, freedom of expression, privacy of the individual, and respect for human, human rights, uh, open multilateral and democratic governance uh, carried out with transparency by stimulating collective creativity and the participation of society, governments, private sector, and uh, mood stakeholder, of course, as she mentioned uh, in her tweets later on. Uh, universality that ensures the social and human development and the construction of inclusive and non-discriminatory societies. Cultural diversity with the, without imposition of beliefs, customs, and values. 
net neutrality guided only by technical and ethical criteria, rendering it inadmissible to restrict it for political, commercial, religious, or any other purposes. And uh, uh, of course, as you know, these, these, these principles were presented by our president in the, context, in the context of the Brazilian response to the uh, surveillance programs that affected the communication of Brazilian citizens, companies, and uh, high-level authorities. Uh, uh, well, I'm mentioning again uh, 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 our Minister Paulo Bernardo and the President. Uh, these principles, we believe, are, uh, should guide us in the direction of a more democratic, transparent uh, internet governance, and uh, uh, to in which uh, ethics also play a, a very important role. It's not my intention here to di divert uh, the focus of our discussion uh, from uh, in the multi stakeholder initiatives uh, developed in. In, in the follow-up of the WISIS Declaration of Principles. However, being from the Brazilian government, I, I, I could not uh, uh, abstain myself from commenting on this very uh, important uh, aspect of our, our policy to internet governance nowadays. Uh, as you know, uh, our president announced the, the, the our intention to, to host a summit uh, in, the next, in the first semester of next year, uh, probably less in the end of April, early May. So, uh, to which, of course, we count on, 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 on the inputs from all mood stakeholders, and we believe uh, will also help us uh, uh, in the follow-up of the WISIS Summit uh, to in the implementation of um, many as aspects of the, the, the WISIS outcomes that today we feel are still uh, not, have not been uh, adequately implemented. So, this is also uh, one initiative that will feed uh, uh, already existing processes. So, uh, well, with th these comments, I think I, I will uh, give the floor to the other panelists, which will present more conc uh, concrete initiatives on, on uh, the implementation of WISIS principles. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandre. The next speaker will be uh, Nina. Uh, Nina, I ask you please to present yourself, and uh, the speaker is, your, your, is yours. Good morning. My name is Nina. Um, I think now I'm wearing the cap of Africa Civil Society, and I'm speaking on my personal behalf. I'm not speaking on behalf of the World Wide Web Foundation. I cannot even pretend to speak on behalf of the whole of Africa. Uh, so I will just be speaking as someone who has been through with us on the civil society side before the WISIS declaration and after the WISIS declaration. Um, and I've been asked to speak a bit on the multi-stakeholder initiative part of it. Um, the, the first thing I would like to do is to give re remind us. Um, I still some vet I see some veterans here. Raul is here. Raul has been there from day minus one, um, <coughs> and I see some other people here around too. I salute you all. Some people have grown gray hair since then. They've grown fatter. They've aged. And 10 years, um, someone who was born during WISIS PrepCom now has a smartphone. Someone who was born at that time now owns a smartphone. That's how far we've come. But I want to point out um, particular issues. Um, WISIS was one that came to bring in civil society. Before then, we, I used to be a human rights activist. I'm a legal person. And I used to be outside of um, UN conferences then. But WISIS was the one that said, okay, you guys come in and let's hear you. So the, that was a, a, a break in tradition, in the UN tradition for civil society and human rights activists. So that was the first initiative in itself. And during the prep comes, there were still hostile governments, but there were open governments that said, no, let's, let's come into the table. And so we did a lot of drafting, 
And the first thing we did was to have the Internet Governance Caucus. There were a lot of caucus and going around, but the civil society established itself as a stakeholder, and we have the, there were caucuses along the action lines, education, human rights, civil society, governance. I still recall we had a finance caucus in those days, child rights. There were a lot of these caucuses, and we did feed in into the general documents, PrepCom 1, PrepCom 2, PrepCom 3, Geneva, then second round, and finally Tunis, and we came out with what we call a Tunis agenda. To be honest, the Tunis agenda did not capture all our desires as civil society, and of course did not capture all my desires as Nenna. But we did realize that this was a watered down um, a consensus document. So now, moving from a watered down consensus document, how do we go about implementing it? And what I can say in multi-stakeholder initiatives is that that in itself has been a victory. At least it has been what the French people call a key. It's been a solid result that at every point in time, all the action line holders, all the action line um, legacy holders, if I can call them UNESCO, ITU, and every other person, have made an effort to be open. Now, what I say is that I recognize that an effort has been made, Mr. Chair. I'm not saying that is effective. And when I was doing the opening speech, I'm asking myself, should we be measuring multi-stakeholderism now? Because it is not enough to, be, to say all stakeholders are welcome. We must make sure that the participation of all stakeholders are equally valued. So the question I'm leaving with you is, as we've been 10 years, can we say that the, the participation of all stakeholders have equal value? That's number one question. The second question is, have we consciously engaged in making sure that the presence, the participation, the contribution, the desires of all stakeholders have equal footing? And finally, now that WISIS is getting to 10 years old, where next are we going? And it's a good thing that this session, Juliano, is being organized by C uh, uh, Brazil, let me say that way. And now Brazil had stood up. Now everyone's looking at Brazil. So my last question will be, what will be the role that Madame Dilma Rousseff, thank you God she's a lady. Oh, thank you Lord that Dilma Rousseff is a lady. So this great nation led by a great woman that is making efforts into looking at what it calls more participative um, approach. So my last question will be, what will be the role of Brazil in multi-stakeholder initiatives around this, the, the policy areas of internet governance in particular and WISIS plus 10 in general? So I don't have answers to give you, and maybe you will regret that you have ever invited me, but I have questions for everyone here. Thank you for now. Thank you, Nina. Our next speaker will be Raul Chevrier. Um, please, Raul Chevrier, everyone knows you, but uh, make your short presentation about it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, um, my name is Raul Echeverria. I'm the executive director, the CEO of uh, LACNIC, the regional registry for internet addresses in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation to co-organize this, uh, this workshop. Uh, I think the, the, the topic of this, uh, of this workshop is really very interesting. And it, the, the first thing that happened to me after I was invited by Giuliano to, to be part of this workshop is, uh, was that I started to think about what happened in 2003. And I had not uh, done that uh, for a long time. 
And this, uh, and it is interesting to when we uh, realize that everything has changed since uh, 2003. And just as one example, uh, remember those of you that uh, were around of those topics uh, at that time, remember that non-governmental organizations were not permitted to participate in most of debates in Geneva in 2003. In fact, we were not permitted to go into the rooms as we were outside of the rooms trying to lobby the, 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 the governmental representatives that uh, were more friendly to us and so try, we were trying to talk to them uh, to explain our points. Um, when we come back to the, to the present time, so we realize that at this moment it's almost impossible to justify that something would be discussed uh, in a non-multi-stakeholder non way. So it's a big change. Sometimes when you are in a, in a conference and um, it is, you are writing or participating in the wording of a, of a resolution, we, you don't uh, understand sometimes the, the real importance of, of what is happening. And in many times, uh, things that are written in this kind of conference uh, have no importance at all. But uh, the impact of this declaration of principles in 2003 was really huge. And I have to confess now, that when I, I look at 2003 again, that the, the solution that was uh, provided by the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan at that time to save the, 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 um, the summit that was very close of a failure, uh, the solution that he proposed to create the working group on internet governance was really a brilliant solution. And the, the working group on internet governance was a multi-stakeholder experience itself. And I, I see the professor Peng Wang, that's a, it's a, it was a, a colleague in, the, in, in that ex adventure, uh, in, the, in that working group. And so I remember the first time that I walked in the Palais des Nations in, in Geneva, as we realized that there was not uh, internet access there. Uh, there was not either uh, enough uh, plugs for connecting our computers. So most of us said, okay, if, th if this is the situation, we cannot work here. As we will not come back because we cannot come to stay uh, two or three days working in a, in a working group in a closed room without connectivity. So the next time when uh, we come back to, to Geneva, everything had changed. We had, um, we had internet access, and uh, the, the, the format of the desk had changed, and we had enough plugs for connecting the computers. And I realized how we were impacting in, in those uh, small things. We were impacting the way in which the, the, the work was done in the in United Nations at the time. It was a, 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 an inflection point that everything changed since that. Uh, so we had the opportunity to arrive to the second part of the summit in 2005 with a more clear understanding among all stakeholders uh, that uh, permitted to consolidate the, the, the principles of the internet governance. So um, let's uh, see what is happening in, 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 in our region in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, uh, let me not, uh, I will beg you to uh, permit me to not be very humble, but I think that uh, LACNIC is a, a, a good example of openness and participation. And we are very open in, the, in, a, in our culture. Probably if uh, we would not have that, had that discussion in 2003 and 2005, we would not have changed the way that uh, we, we used to work. But we understood in, in that process the importance of involving all stakeholders and to be open to the inputs uh, coming from different uh, interest group. And so now it, is, it, it, it became part of our culture. Now we cannot conceive the wor the, the, our work without that openness. And we are not uh, only open to the um, uh, inputs uh, coming from other stakeholder groups, but we are proactively in engaging, uh, looking for engagement of all stakeholders. So we don't wait for people to come uh, to us to, to work with us, we are we go there trying to engage the 
the people, we have usually meetings with governments and civil society trying to understand what we can do in order to satisfy their, their expectations. In fact, we will have tomorrow a meeting with civil society representatives from our region taking advantage of their presence here. It's in, in that direction, trying to understand what we can do, what do you expect from us, and, and, and trying to anticipate any, 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 any claim from, from those groups. And the level, I have to say that the level of maturity in the relations among stakeholders in Latin America and the Caribbean is really impressive. The, there are a lot of examples. For example, one is the ELAC. ELAC is the, is the information society development process in the region. That is a, 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 a process that is led by ECLAC, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, it's part of the UN system. They act as the, they don't lead, they act as the secretariat of the, of the process. It is led by the governments. And in, um, in the first meeting that was held in 2005, it happened the same that I mentioned uh, with regard to, uh, to WISIS. The, the non-governmental organizations were not allowed to participate in the discussions. And now, uh, since 2008, we not only are, are allowed to uh, go into the rooms and participate in the debates, but also we are part of the following up mechanism. There, are the, there is a mechanism that is formed by governments and representatives from civil society and private sector and technical community. And we are following up in between the, the, the meetings, the, the ministerial meetings, we are in church, this mechanism is in church of following up all what is happening in the, in the region with regard to the development of information society. And this, so the traditional intergovernmental forums are increasing openness in the region and are, we are not only a, uh, allowed to participate, but I invited to participate. So now I can say that this is bidirectional. Uh, uh, Non-governmental stakeholders are, are more open to the participation of governments and to the other stakeholders too. And also the traditional governmental uh, environments are open to the participation of other groups. I think that uh, this uh, uh, happens just because the, the, what we did uh, 10 years ago in 2003 in Geneva when the, 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 WISIS, uh, the first part of the WISIS summit uh, adopted the, those uh, internet governance principles. Now what is the challenge? I think that the next challenge is to go one step uh, forward and, and to increase the, the, the number of, to set up uh, the multi-stakeholder mechanisms at the national level. And of course, there are some uh, good uh, examples like that have been mentioned here, like the Brazilian one, and there are other examples also around the world. But uh, the, the most common is that same governments or same people that uh, promote multi-stakeholder governance mechanisms at the in international level, they don't implement uh, multi-stakeholder environments in the, at the national level. And th I think this is the way that what we need now in order to have more involvement in the, in the, of uh, all stakeholders in, in, in public policies at the, that are mainly the, the developed at the national level. Thank you. Thank you, Raul. So now uh, me and Christina we will present the, the case of uh, combat against spam using a technique called uh, Management of Port 25. First, Christina will do the technical background and explain the situation, and later uh, we will present uh, how uh, we implement this solution in Brazil. Christina, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Christine. I am from the technical community, the technical side, so I'm going to dive a little bit more in the technical area. And specifically, uh, this effort that we did in Brazil, I think it's one of the examples of how uh, the multi-stakeholder model not only takes people from different countries or different sectors, but also from different backgrounds. This was an effort that actually took, brought together people from the legal area, from 
policy making areas, the technical people, all to understand the same problem and try to see how all cooperating and doing everyone its part would actually make a difference for uh, the spam situation in Brazil. As Enrique said, uh, I will talk a little bit about what it is that we were trying to solve. So yesterday, for people that were in the main session, spam was a, ma was a major issue being discussed there. And I think it was pretty clear that we have several different areas to combat spam. Uh, even the definition of spam is not actually clear. There's uh, the criminal activities uh, involving spam. There are botnets being used to send spam. Uh, there is also uh, uh, enterprising sending advertisement and that people call spam. So it's it's really a, a broad problem. And then in Hiki will talk more about the challenges and how was the multi-stakeholder effort that we conducted in all the meetings and negotiations. But basically, what was the part of the spam problem that we were talking, that trying to resolve? It was not really all spam. There is no solution that would be able to solve everything. And back in um, 2009, especially Brazil was being called like the king of spam, the country that had most spam in the world. And uh, we were already doing some studies at that time that we expanded with the, help, with the support from the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee in CERT BR, we were doing some studies. And we were able to show that more than 90% of all spam that was leaving Brazil was actually coming from other countries. So. The Brazil was not a source of spam, and as most countries, we were just uh, the middleman. We were just someone being abused, a network being abused, our infrastructure, our users to send spam. And this was having a negative effect in the country and problems for our networks. We had networks being inserted in blacklists. We have people having difficulty to send spam. And the common goal for everybody was really how to reduce the abuse of the Brazilian internet infrastructure by spammers and by criminals. So I think this is the major point. Um, from a technical point of view, the name is very complicated. It's like port 25 manager, but what it is. It's really that email um, started in the very beginning if we were talking where everybody would just connect into a Unix machine and that was the early days. No one would have smartphones or PCs at home. So basically, we would use the same protocol and the same um, uh, technical um, uh, uses and, and technical means to submit emails and transport and everything. And what this is really is an evolution to separate. Okay, one thing is I from my smartphone sending an email to my provider and, and delivering. And what this is is really to separate. So if I would just, there's an image here just to see that, you know, like the legitimate users, what do you do? You have a Hotmail, Gmail, or whatever account. You just send an email that goes to your provider. That is the first loop. And the second one, that provider delivers to the other one. The thing is that the spammers, they subvert that. They, they really, as the protocol is the same, they just go and deliver themselves. And that's what's really the problem we're trying to see, is that people were not using the fair use of the internet, but not using the right protocols, and we were having a lot of problems. And to implement that, technically, it's basically easy. Oh, you have like that gray area, there is the end user. So if we can stop the red uh, area, the, the spammers to really send spam, uh, to people that would solve the problem. That technically was easy, but that, okay, there are some other problems. We were discussing net neutrality, like Enrique would say later, we were discussing uh, all the users will have to change their configurations, what would that be? So something that technically was kind of obvious became a little bit more complicated because you were changing a lot of things on the internet. But uh, when we were talking to especially the consumer rights protections organizations, the Ministry of Justice, uh, the prosecutors, and the legal part, it was very clear that this is the scene after we adopted the change. It said nothing changes from the first one. It's really I am sending an email, someone is receiving that email, and basically I'm talking to my provider and the other is talking, so what's changed? Mm, but conceptually, not much. What really changed is that they have to use a little small configuration. But the dramatic change is that 
the spammers cannot abuse the network anymore. So basically, we were able to stop spammers to abuse most of Brazilian networks, most of the botnets in Brazil. Uh, this was an effort that involved a lot of people to make sure that we were not uh, doing anything that would harm anyone. And from like the perspective of the technical people, that was pretty much clear. But we had to involve everyone to understand how that worked. And what would be the real benefits of that? So these are just some of the major ones that we are already feeling since the beginning of this year. That was when we finished the implementation. Uh, the first one is that this is not something that acts on content. There is no content inspection. There is nothing actually saying that a message is a spam because someone thinks that's a spam. It is just a technical way to stop spammers before the spam actually enters the network. So it's really just stopping people from abusing their networks. Uh, we had a dramatic in decrease in the number of Brazilian IPs listed in blacklists. So most of the operators, they don't have to deal with blacklists anymore. It's, there is still some machines, yes. We still have like some small enterprises, uh, some universities that get compromised, some machines, but it's not in that big volume. And Hiki will show some data later. Uh, uh, bottom line, it makes harder for people to abuse the machines. Maybe they can steal uh, credentials, they can try to do something else, but at the end that increases the cost of sending spam. And that really reduces the value of the infected machines. We probably still have machines infected in Brazil, there are botnets in there doing other things, but they cannot send spam anymore. So that reduces a lot the value of those infected machines in Brazil. And one of the things that you can see, I passed through some technical slides here. Our major challenge from my side in the technical area is really to explain how it really worked, why it was good, why it was not inspecting content, why it is different from just saying that something is spam based on someone thinking that, oh, this is appropriate or it's not. It is just really uh, one of the met methods to separate what is abuse of networks from what is real use and fair use of networks from the users. And But to implement that, we had to really bring all the sectors of the society together to understand, to see what would be the best way to implement and to actually make this effort uh, to work very well. So I'm going to pass to Henrique now so he can go really to, uh, I think what's the most important in this panel, that is the multi-stakeholder part of, of this initiative. Thank you, Christine. So uh, we believe this uh, initiative in Brazil uh, against Spanish is, is, is a good case for the multi-stakeholder initiative and as, a, as an example of multi-stakeholder initiative. When we start uh, discussing this spam problem in Brazil, uh, inside the CGI, the Internet Brazilian Steering Committee, we discuss uh, several aspects of this spam problem. Since it's legislation, that uh, there is a lack of legislation in Brazil about the spam, uh, the question about the email marketing, and uh, and also uh, this idea of providing a technical solution to avoid, uh, to uh, block the spam before uh, it's emitted. Uh, we, we studied, and as Christina told us, that most of the spam that was uh, sent fr uh, from the Brazilian network comes from uh, machines that was compromised. So we, we, we put this project on, the, on this, uh, tasking force against spam as a prior priority. So uh, now I sh I'll show you that uh, after five or six years, we we succeed because after the implementation that finished this year, we uh, we, are, we are in, in 2009 uh, as of the first, the first or second place as the country that's in more spam in the world and now we, we are in the 2050 position. Uh, we, we have for some months a very stable situation on the, on, on the statistics uh, after we did, imp after we implemented these ideas.
first, uh, I will make a short presentation of our body, the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. Most of you know uh, our organization. In fact, we are here since 95, since the introduction of commercial internet in Brazil. Uh, we are, uh, since the beginning, uh, a multi-stakeholder uh, group comprised of a, a government, uh, people from the government, from the uh, civil society, I mean ONGs, uh, from the private sector. Myself, I'm, uh, I was elected from the software and hardware community. Uh, there are uh, three other uh, board members that come from private sector also, and we, are, we ha ha also have representatives from the uh, academia. Uh, our, uh, our mandate uh, comprises these things that I, I showed in the slide. So the proposed policies, the recommended standards, uh, established strategies, directors uh, uh, related to the use of the internet. We are, in fact, uh, the name of uh, CGIBI is Comité Gestor da Internet. But in fact, we are the governance. We are involved in the, on, the, uh, on the governance of the internet, but not uh, on the uh, gestion and the gestion of the internet in Brazil. We are responsible, of course, about the allocation of the IPs and also for the uh, for the no, do domain name uh, under .br. So we we provide the service for the registration under the .br and the .br suffix. Uh, we since in, since two, 2005, we have a department also on CGI. On NICBR, in fact, that's the that's the organization that has the uh, has the staff that provides uh, statistics about the internet in Brazil. Uh, this uh, department called CETIC. Uh, it's it's a very important department as a source of information about about uh, uh, internet and uh, user of the internet on the on the Rome and the companies. Uh, on education and etc. So uh, that's the uh, that's the chart of the organization we have here uh, on the on the left side the representation from the government. You have nine persons representing different ministries. Uh, the CGI uh, itself is coordinated by. A person from government, uh, Virgilio, uh, is here at IGF. Uh, he comes from the uh, Ministry of Science of Technology. He is the coordinator from the uh, on CGIBR. We have also an internet expert, Demi, uh, who is the the president of the organization that uh, makes the operations uh, that uh, uh, NICBR. Uh, Operationalized uh, what CGIBR decided as a, a strategic for the internet, Brazilian internet governance. And the other side, you have uh, the 11 persons that was elected in a process for a um, three years mandate. Uh, I show you have uh, four from private sector, four from third sector and uh, society, and uh, three from uh, uh, academia. Okay. Uh, this uh, this effort uh, against spam was very complex. In fact, when we start, uh, few people uh, could believe that <laughs> the problem could be attacked because uh, it involves a lot of things. Involves, uh, of course, filtering on the client side. It involves uh, problems like uh, email marketing. Uh, so the uh, legislation, maybe. So the the way that you choose to attack the problem uh, was to uh, avoid that uh, uh, the abuse of the network, and it, uh, this should be coordinated between different players, different stakeholders. Uh, internet in Brazil is very complex because we have uh, more than 
third companies, I mean, since the telecom companies that provide DSL service, uh, uh, mobile operators that provide the all the all the connectivity to the to the through the 3G and uh, and cell phones, smartphones, etc., and also the cable operators. This uh, this part of the industry was very important because. Uh, the process of uh, blocking port 125 must be done at, at the ISP level because the user should be uh, instructed to uh, change their configuration from port 25 to a new port, port 587, but it's not enough to change their configuration through the ISP. If the operators, if the telco operator doesn't block on the network uh, the traffic uh, through port 25, nothing will happen. Uh, the situation will, will became the, the same. So this kind of coordination between these those uh, uh, tens of companies, tons, tens of telco companies, two or three thousand ISP companies, and also all the uh, institutions that was uh, involved on that, uh, mainly Anatel. Anatel uh, is the Brazilian telco regulator. In fact, we, since the beginning, we should involve uh, Anatel because uh, the uh, telco operators told us that uh, they are under contracts with the agents and they should do nothing without a formal, uh, formal agreement with the agents. So uh, the, the steps are following. Uh, we start the CGI uh, make a resolution uh, saying that that uh, port 25 should be blocked because it, sh it should be good for the uh, combat to the span. Based on that, we convince, we convince the Anatel, the, uh, the agents, to make also a resolution that was uh, an enforcement to tell cooperators to make this blocking also. Uh, at, at this moment, uh, the ISPs, we, we, are, have meet, we have several meetings with all these stakeholders during three years, and the ISPs are working on converting their base from port 25 to port 587. But uh, the ISPs did their work. I mean, big ISPs, the biggest ISPs convert and, and help us to make the awareness and education of the customers about the, 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 this effort. But uh, we, we didn't start yet the blocking, effective blocking by the operators. <coughs> Finally, uh, after we have the agreement uh, of the telco agency uh, to, to do that, uh, the telco companies uh, argue that maybe it's not enough because the consumers could go to justice asking for their rights because it was not uh, was not expect on their contracts that the port 25 should be blocked. So we again went to the government, to the uh, uh, Ministry of Justice, uh, especially to the Department of Consumer Protection, together with the Association of Consumer Protection, to explain how it's important uh, to block this port in order to make the Brazilian network better. And uh, we from some months <laughs> after, we have a, a technical paper uh, provided by the Minister of Justice saying that uh, it is good for the consumer to, uh, to block this board. And fin finally, we sign an agreement between all parties, I mean, the ISPs, the telcos, cable TV operators, uh, Anatel, the Ministry of Justice, uh, everybody, putting a, a, a framework, a time frame to implement the measure. 
So we start this on March. On uh, end of March of uh, to, uh, last year, from uh, end of March last year to March to March this year. So in one year, the the telco companies uh, in uh, uh, region by region, they was they blocked they blocked the the port 25 uh, on their networks and and the results appeared. Appeared. In fact, uh, uh, me, uh, Christina mentioned, but it's very important to mention that all this effort was uh, directed to Rome users. Uh, I mean, people who use computers uh, as using any technology, but as uh, with a dynamic IP. We, we don't uh, change uh, anything to the companies that has uh, IP, uh, direct IPs. I mean, so, but it, it was a huge, it was a huge uh, uh, effort because we are talking about over 50 million internet users in Brazil. Uh, we are working on that, on the education through uh, a website that we developed it's called unspun.br. But we are not sure uh, how much uh, noise will be happen uh, when, in fact, we uh, change the key. Uh, there, there was a, there was a, a good thing uh, on that uh, on that uh, project because the people who use webmail was not a fact on this. Uh, change because they already use other ports to send emails, but uh, a portion of people that use, say, uh, programs like uh, email, probably like Thunderbird or Outlook, uh, should uh, should uh, change this port. So uh, we make a, a, a group to over over uh, cite the noise that can happen when the, the, the key was changed. In for, for our surprise, because of the Orange campaign that has more than three years before we changed the key, the noise was very low, very low. In fact, sometimes we doubt that the <laughs> telcos were, uh, were closing the part 25. But the results, I will show the results to see how, how the thing evolved. Uh, on that. Here, that's one of the campaigns that we made. We made campaigns uh, through the ISPs and through uh, press release and uh, press conferences. Uh, in fact, you, much, much time before we closed the Port 25, uh, all the technical community knows about the benefits and we are are advocating uh, for us in campaigns, uh, use campaigns like that. We also make some flyers when we, sh we show what Christina showed before, uh, how, uh, we, how we, we implement the use of email through uh, email provider, not, not allowing direct emailing from the uh, users of uh, home computers. Huh? Yeah, that's those are, that are all the results. This graph shows the uh, complaints that uh, people uh, make to CERT-BR, to CGI-BR against PEN. So you see clearly after uh, 2011 that the, the, the claims are getting lower. But but the important thing is we measure through the blacklist, through the CBL, CBL uh, how the blocking of IPs in Brazil grow exponentially low after we implement the measure. In November, uh, November uh, last year, it will have 600,000 IPs Brazilian IPs listed in blacklist. And you, we are in second position 
as the country who uh, uh, most, uh, most sent this fund to the world. After the blocking, you say, you are going down in the number of uh, IPs, IPs listed, IPs listed on the blacklist, and we, uh, we now are in the, we are between 20 uh, and 30 position, maybe mainly 25 for, since, uh, since we finish, we finish this transition. So, it was successful, it was successful. Uh, 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 the uh, the internet uh, the use of bandwidth uh, of the internet uh, through abuse uh, of spammers that use our network decrease uh, the sensation from the users that uh, was abused uh, sending email that he doesn't know was uh, going through their machines, uh, their, the quality of their connect, the, those connections uh, getting, getting better, and we have very few noise on the, on the, from the users about the change that uh, should be made. In fact, uh, when someone uh, uh, make a claim on the internet saying I can't spend I, I can't send more email I don't know what's happening tens of people respond oh changed to port 587 because uh, Brazil Brazil make make made this uh, change uh, uh, since November so it was successful uh, here also I, I show you how the the biggest ISNs in Brazil, the big operators, uh, come out from the blacklist. Uh, we have here one that has alone uh, 125,000 IPs and goes to year zero. So everybody, uh, everybody was positively affected. So here is the, the reference, the our unspun. Uh, website with the spam pot projects and you know, some documents that uh, we have prepared uh, and we are available on, on our website well so uh, that's the that's our project I, I believe now you can open for discussion for the uh, all the for the all the talks that we have in this section Well, I, I have myself a question. Uh, first, this, I'd like to thank all panelists to have accepted to come along to discuss such an important matter. And it's interesting to see and, and to hear so many uh, different and interesting views coming from developing countries. I'm really glad to to uh, to the result of this this workshop uh, uh, well the advancements of the internet in the last 10 years are great and I believe uh, WISIS process have contributed with many of the achieve, achieve, achievements reached by international community still there are many challenges to be overcome many related to digital inclusion security and many related to build a democratic internet where human rights such as freedom of expression and privacy are effectively guaranteed. As an example, only a third part of the world population have access to the internet. Uh, and there are other challenges related to the struggle to implement concepts like network neutrality, a concept so important to guarantee innovation on the internet and a democratic communication environment. The results of Port 25 presented by Cristini in, uh, in Hiki are just an example of the power that multi-stakeholder initiatives have to implement the principles debated at WISIS uh, process and principles debated in, in the country levels, like the principles 
developed by the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, which is a multi-stakeholder organism uh, for created to discuss the challenge of, int of the Internet in Brazil. The Internet governance regime at international level has been shaped in the last four decades according to the interest of actors that, in a context of a global technological competition, have acquired uh, have an explicit uh, differential power. This differential is based on the knowledge they have acquired during the Internet historical development process. It enables these actors to understand better than others the political and economical implications resulting from a structuring regime and thus influence the definition of rules, principles, and globally applicable standards in accordance with their political and economical interests. What I'd like to ask is in what degree the failures to implement WISIS principles, looking to the failures now, and uh, are related to the failure to implement mood stakeholderism in a global level to overcome uh, these inequalities created uh, by a structuring regime. <clears throat> I didn't realize I was going to get the mic quickly. But I think um, that's a very important question. And that's why I was speaking earlier about measurement. Now, I'm in a very bad situation to say this because I'm in a CGI.br session. And it will look as if um, I'm throwing flowers on Brazil, which is not my nature. But I would have loved to be in another session, maybe in an African session, and be saying this. How many countries can openly declare their processes, its instances, their participants at the IGF? Apart from Brazil, how many other countries can do this? It's unfortunate I'm in a Brazil thing. I would have loved to speak what I want to say to many other African countries. How many other countries are actually organizing stuff in the IG session this year, apart from Brazil? I would love to hear those numbers. Anyway, that's by the side. But maybe I would like to say that multi-stakeholder participation is actually the other name for democracy. And because I'm a Nigerian living in Cote d'Ivoire, partly in Cote d'Ivoire, partly in Ghana, and moving around Africa, I would love to say that the failure in multi-stakeholder approach is not different from the failure in democracy, transparency, and accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very good comments. Uh, let me just add uh, some comments uh, myself. Uh, I do agree with you. Uh, well, there are many uh, areas in the in the follow follow up to this is that we need uh, to work harder, uh, especially uh, uh, the inclusion of uh, <laughs> a, a, a bigger part of of the world population in the internet, having good internet access. Uh, this is something uh, Brazil is concerned as well. Uh, we have been Im implementing policies, uh, the national broadband policy, in order to expand access to internet with quality to uh, a bigger part of our population. And uh, as you, ma you mentioned, uh, uh, other areas, and we, we, uh, we, we believe that this is the reason uh, all countries and all stakeholders uh, need to dedicate uh, themselves to the, the review process of, of the WISIS to, you know, uh, it's just not only identify the, uh, areas where uh, w we, we came short of uh, implementing uh, uh, the, 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 the results of WISIS, but uh, in order to propose how can we move forward and, and, and uh, and identify a, a, a way to, to, to resolve tho those issues. Uh, thank you. This is okay. 
I, I think that there are different kind of uh, countries. Uh, we have countries that are convinced uh, about the benefits of the multi-stakeholder uh, model. Uh, I like what Nena said uh, with regard to the, that this is the new name of democracy. It's a, um, it, and I'm convinced that uh, most of the developments of the democratic system that we will see in the next few years uh, go through the implementation of multi-stakeholder models in different areas. So there are some countries that are convinced about the benefit and they, they are trying to implement or they, or they have already implemented mechanism, uh, multi-stakeholder mechanism. Um, Brazil is a, is, is, is a notable example. And uh, I come from Uruguay. Uruguay has also a, a multi-stakeholder model that is different from the Brazilian one, but it's also workable. And I guess that there are other, I have uh, heard about Kenyan, uh, um, model and, and other, other initiatives in other countries. This is one uh, set of countries. There are other set of countries that are, that they, they have in, in the, their political, um, the, the, or the values of the, those countries are aligned with, the, with, the, um, with those uh, values that we are trying to promote through the multi-stakeholder model, but for some reasons, they have not moved to the implementation of the, of the multi-stakeholder models. And there are other set of countries that are countries that don't share those values, are not interested in them because are countries that are not in favor of freedom of expression, of um, participation of the citizens, but not only, this is not only limited to the internet, but there are countries where the human rights are not respected at all and and so it is it, it, it is uh, um, it, it is not um, expectable that they, they will implement mechanisms uh, for increasing the participation and openness and participation in, in the internet governance if they don't do that the, the same things in the in rest of activities in the society but so, as, uh, I think that there is a, a large group of countries that is in the second group that I mentioned, that this is the, the countries where we have to uh, focus our action because it's where we can get good uh, uh, results with, um, with um, reasonable uh, work. And I think that uh, there are many countries that are participating in this kind of uh, of forums and um, going around and looking at the examples that are being presented in, in different workshops and they are paying attention. And I th I'm very optimistic in the sense that when we will go through the, all the process in next year of the re review of WISIS and also those, mi those this process that is being launched for uh, trying to look for um, an alternative uh, multi-stakeholder model for the governance of the internet with a, the, the, the meeting that will be in Brazil. I think that so when we will go through this process, we will uh, get more uh, governments and also more stakeholders claiming for the implementation of multi-stakeholder models at the national level. And so I think that the result will be good. Uh, but I, I would not say necessarily that, the, uh, coming back to your question, that the failure is because the lack of multi-stakeholder model. I think that there are things that are going um, together. The evolution of the, the democracy and the democratic system in some countries with the implementation of this uh, new fashion of, uh, of models and new ways of participation of the, of the society. Okay, this one is a story and you can analyze it the way you want. In December, there was the World Conference on information technology in Dubai, where the ITU was renewing the international uh, telecommunications regulations and um, internet governance was a huge debate in that meeting. I had funding as civil society to attend, but that meeting was not open to civil society as such. You needed to come under um, you needed someone who had an ITU uh, handle to register you. Basically, you needed to come under a delegation of one of the ITU members. 
And so I send an email to three entities. One, two government organizations, and one Pan-African organization. One government organization, one government replied me and said, this is not a meeting where for people like you. That's the, that's the official reply. The other government organization said, we may not have money to pay your per diem. And the third Pan-African organization said, we will refer it to what to our higher order and get a reply and give you. So those were the three responses. Basically saying, no, we don't want you. I sent a letter to a technical organization and they said, no problem. The next 24 hours I was registered. That's technical community. And so I get to Dubai. And when they started discussions, I had already said I'm a legally trained person. So I read, and the, the smaller the pages, the more I want to read it. That's my nature. I read. And when we started discussions, the first government that said they didn't have pay DM said, oh, you know, you could join our delegation. Um, there are about 64 of us here, but we don't really have experts in the field. And I'm like, okay. The next day, they registered me now as an official delegation of that country. The other country that said... It's not for people like you. It's high level. Only people at ministerial level will register us. Only two of them came, and none of them could understand English. And they called me and said, could you help let us understand what is going on? And the third organization that said we will refer it to higher authorities came and said, you know, we need someone to take notes and in French and English, could you come and help us be part of our secretariat? Because now I'm in Dubai and they're seeing me. And the funny story is that we had an African meeting and someone who has known me through the WISIS years as civil society, and this is someone within the government that is anti-civil society. That's the third group that Raul is talking about. So now that this, that other government has registered me as a government delegate, ITU will change the color of your badge. You know what I mean? So my badge changes from this color to the government color. That means now I can speak on behalf of government A. So we have this Africa meeting, and because government A has recognized that I have expertise, now they say, no, you go ahead and speak. You are not, and now become second in the delegation. And this person walks in and says, what are civil society people doing in this room? And he's, I mean, he's looking at me and screaming, basically screaming. And I'm like, keep cool, keep cool. And someone calls him and says, calls him, in, in, you know the way Africans talk, my brother, we are not doing anything hidden here. And we've always had these people work with us. So please, can you cool down? And mind you, we have been live cast. Some people on remote participation may hear you. And he was ashamed. So look at this scenario and analyze it for yourself. I would uh, just to add, not a motor stakeholder, but you said a little bit about challenges in security. Um, security is very complex. It's very hard to understand. And as I am from the security community and a security expert, what I'm seeing that worries me most is that uh, we are seeing security being used as an excuse to implement control and people don't understand what exactly will make people more secure or what is just making it easier to control or to control people or to control access or information. And then at the other hand, we have a lot of people that want more privacy and more security being against some key security measures, thinking that that would give more control. So this is, I think, one of the challenges in, in this community to really, uh, this is just one of the examples on the com complex technical nature of some things that are not being understand, uh, I think are being wrongly leveraged by some people to actually exert control or exert any agendas, and then at the end, we are just not improving security at all. 
sometimes just debating what do or not do. And I think this is one of the challenges in, you were talking about the past 10 years. Uh, we could have done more to, to evolve, but I think it really needs more understanding, more technical people understanding the policy level uh, challenges, uh, the policymakers understanding the technical uh, areas, not really to understand how to implement things, but really to understand, okay, what actually is this that people are using? And not to make claims or to have like those ideas just because someone said, or and, and this is something that worries me a lot. And I think it's being, I think, a failure of communication between the different communities. And it's something that everybody needs to worry a lot because security is in the spotlight and people are just talking without necessarily uh, knowing what exactly are the repercussions and what could happen depending on what's implemented, what's regulated, or what is really proposed out there. Just a comment. Yeah, I have just a little comment on the difficulties of multi-stakeholder model in order to have a space for more questions about the presentations. Uh, in fact, um, the multi-stake model uh, is not an easy, an easy task. Even in, at, the local, uh, at the local government of the internet, we can have tensions between the different stakeholders, mean governments, private sector, Different different kinds of private sector, um, uh, academia, etc. So, but uh, we believe that these difficulties, these tensions, those tensions and those uh, efforts to search for uh, consensus between this group, those groups are are are, are, are rich. A rich uh, process, a rich process, but uh, it, it's not it's, it's not easy inside one country, say Brazil, that's worked on that model for over 15 years. Uh, it could be it could be noted that uh, each country has has different backgrounds and culture, and the tensions sh uh, sh should appear also at the national level in, 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 in other countries. But these difficulties uh, are not uh, an obsta obstacle to, 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 do, to go in on that direction because uh, I, I, we can't see, we can't see any model that could be better than this multi stakeholder model uh, because uh, it's uh, it's uh, the government uh, taking the taking the main role on the government of the internet, as uh, as the some agents, telco agents, uh, tend to try to do. It was not a good solution for the internet in the way that we believe it it should be. But anyway, uh, I have five minutes. Uh, I believe the microphone is open for more questions, and we should finish it in five minutes more. Anyone else have a question? Uh, so. I don't know if, if five minutes will be sufficient, but I'll ask the question anyway. <laughs> uh, I was wondering what's your opinion about the gap, which I believe there exists in a gap, between the technical community and the community that defines the, poli uh, the policies. Because sometimes we can see that people defining policies because they don't know about technical stuff. They, as uh, Christine mentioned before, uh, they may define policies that are not aligned with the technical uh, stuff that we have today. And uh, on the other way around as well, uh, we may have tools that are interesting to implement some things, but then because the technical people don't understand properly the policies, those implementations may not be adequate, not because of uh, the technical tools that we have, but because the tools themselves uh, may uh, hurt the policies that has been defined by someone else. So. What's, do you believe that there is any uh, mechanism to 
try to uh, make those two different communities to talk to each other? I would just start making a comment about, I think, the experience that I had as someone technical in the seven years that we were talking about Port 25 management, uh, and also as Cert PR. I think uh, there is a lot of preconceptions when we start talking to different sectors and different actors. Uh, there is a huge problem of vocabulary. So this, I think, it's a major challenge. And not only that people don't understand what you're saying, but that the same words mean different things in different worlds. Uh, that makes a lot of people to overreact. So there is a lot of overreaction because just a word that it's not that powerful in technical areas. It's just like that word that is forbidden in the policy making level. So um, maybe we should try to have like a, uh, a vocabulary for technical and non-technical people. Uh, we are discussing a lot about having like uh, governance um, training and everything. And the thing that we are discussing the most with a uh, team from the Internet Steering Committee, it's, it's really how to convince the technical people that they need to attend the policy level sessions and to convince the policy level people that they need to understand about technical stuff. And one of the things that I think is the media now that I'm really worried, uh, we kind of in the technical community, I'm just joking, that's the Snowden effect because every time that there is a Snowden leak in the media, someone has this brilliant idea about security that they say, okay, that's never gonna work. And, but they need to react, sometimes overreact. Um, I think there is no uh, recipe. All the talks that we had, especially with the legal people, uh, it was hard, but as both uh, sides were really willing to understand what each other were doing and they were trying to, to have a common goal that was to reduce spam in Brazil. Uh, two, three, four meetings, a lot of different drawings and, and we were trying to bridge this gap and then at the end we actually uh, came up with something that was very valuable because it was something that would be useful for the whole community. So I don't know if there is a secret but if both parties are willing to to talk and exchange I think that is is the way to go I don't know if Raul sees that in Lacnik too yes it's a very short uh, answer this is uh, our daily work trying to influence uh, people that make decisions in order to allow them to take uh, uh, informed decisions uh, it is um, a permanent challenge because uh, there is always a uh, new uh, congressman, new senator, a new pe person in the in in the government that uh, is have uh, ideas and push for some new ideas. So it is almost impossible to talk to everybody. But uh, this is uh, the, the the work that we do every day. I don't think that uh, that there is um, um despite the fact that I I agree with uh, what uh, Christine said about the overreactions. Uh, um, I, I think that uh, at least in Latin America, our experience is that people is usually open to talk. Um, but it is difficult to to be in touch with uh, everybody. But uh, when when possible, usually people is open to to know about what are the implications of the the ideas that they are promoting. So our experience is is positive, but it's, uh, it's the, the daily work that we do is a, a permanent challenge. a question for the audience. Okay, I'd like to thank you for your attendance and I believe it was a uh, good workshop with good ideas uh, and exchange of some uh, experience that uh, showed that the mood stakeholder model is uh, it's good to go along. Thank you. <laughs>